Hello, scientific writers. In today's video, we're going to talk about preprints. What are preprints? Where did preprints come from? How are they used right now? Are there benefits and drawbacks to preprints? And all of that will wrap up into answering the question, should you publish your research as a preprint? Hi, this is Brian from the Grants and Publications YouTube channel. Thanks for joining me today. Now in this video, I'm going to cite a lot of sources. All of my sources are in the description below. So take a look at that if you would like to dig deeper. What are preprints? First, let's have a definition. So one of the best definitions I have seen comes from this article. Preprints are versions of manuscripts made public, often on a preprint server, before the conclusion of a formal, often journal-organized editorial process. Using preprints to separate in-depth review from the initial act of sharing can increase efficiency while requiring minimal extra work for authors and presenting science in a format that is easily recognized by readers. That basically covers what a preprint is. It's when you take your completed manuscript and you publish that manuscript with no peer review. So you're releasing it into the wild and you're hoping that colleagues in your field will read that preprint and give you some feedback so that you can make it better before you submit it to a journal so that when you do submit it to a journal, the review process will be more smooth and you'll have fewer criticisms because you've already caught those criticisms and addressed them. So that's the general concept behind a preprint. Preprints started in 1991. That's a long time ago. So a lot of you watching this video might not have even been born when preprints first started. And they were started by the physics community with a server called Archive. Physics was the only one doing this for a long time. Eventually, the life sciences community started Bioarchive in 2013, and then the chemistry community started Chem Archive in 2017, and then Med Archive started in 2019. This is an article from Nature in 1999 talking about U.S. biologists proposing a launch of an electronic preprint archive. This effort did not take. As I told you just a few seconds ago, BioArchive didn't start until 2013. So it took a few tries to get it going. And one of the reasons it didn't take, we see over here in this highlighted text, the main obstacle facing the archive is the fear that publishing an e-print will preclude later publication in a peer-reviewed journal. But eventually, the bioarchive was started. Now, this is an article describing the Chem Archive from 2020 and is talking about the success of the Chem Archive following its beginning in 2017. This article from the BMJ discusses the MedArchive preprint server, and this was published in 2019. Now, so far, I've talked about Archive, BioArchive, Chem Archive, and MedArchive, but those are not the only preprint servers out there. This article from 2020 searched for preprint servers and found 44 preprint platforms having a biomedical and medical scope. So there are a lot of preprint servers out there. It's not just the four that we've talked about so far. When I mentioned the 1999 proposal to start a preprint server for biology, I showed you that there was some resistance from the journals. What about now? This is an editorial from 2019, Clinical Orthopedics and Related Research, the Bone and Joint Journal, the Journal of Orthopedic Research, and the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery will not accept clinical research manuscripts previously posted to preprint servers. So as recently as 2019, we still have some journals that are resisting preprints. However, this study in 2020 examined the top 100 ranked clinical journals. And the results of this study were that they found that 86 of these top 100 journals allow preprints. 13 of the journals have a case-by-case -case determination, and only one of the top 100 journals had an outright prohibition on preprints. What about funding agencies? This is a recent article from late September 2021. The Australian Research Council, up until very recently, had not allowed applicants to cite or even mention preprints in their application or the application 
was withdrawn. In fact, in the most recent funding cycle before this article, more than 30 applications worth 22 million Australian dollars were ruled ineligible because they had cited preprints. Researchers were furious about this, and so now the ARC has reversed their policy and they allow applicants to cite preprints. In the United States, the NIH is a bit more proactive. As of 2017, they were allowing preprints to be cited in applications for funding. In fact, they say the NIH encourages investigators to use interim research products such as preprints to speed the dissemination and enhance the rigor of their work. Now let's look at the adoption rate of preprints. Let's go back to this article from 1999 and look at this graph right in the middle of the slide here that shows the monthly submissions to the physics archive from 1992 to 1999. And you can see that there's a quite a steep slope on the submission rate. So it was being rapidly accepted by the physics community. When we look at BioArchive from the beginning of 2014 through October of 2019, you can see the number of papers that have been submitted to the archive each month, and that is basically increasing month by month. And a lot of those papers are being revised. On the right side of the slide, we see the cumulative number of papers. And by 2019, the cumulative number of papers was approaching 70,000. In this 2020 article from JAMA, we see the submissions and downloads of preprints over the first year of MedArchive. By the second half of the year, it really started to pick up and we had a lot of manuscripts that were being posted to the preprint server. So it appears that it is being accepted by a certain percentage of the medical community. Let's discuss the pros and cons of preprints. So in this infographic from ASAP Bio, we see another definition of a preprint. It's a scientific manuscript that is uploaded by the authors to a public server. And these are the benefits that ASAP Bio claims for preprints. You can get a priority claim. So if you are in a competitive research situation where you want to be the first to publish, getting it out in a preprint is much faster than getting it out in a journal publication where you have to go through the review process, which might take several months or even several years in some cases. And a preprint is going to be a couple of days. They claim that you can increase citations by using preprints, that you can also receive feedback, and that you can use it as proof of productivity. Now we've already mentioned receiving feedback when we defined preprints, and we've also mentioned proof of productivity in grant applications. Let's look at some additional pros and cons of preprints. This is an article called 10 Simple Rules to Consider Regarding Preprint Submission. They go over some of the same points we just saw in the previous slide, but there's some new ones too. Preprints speed up dissemination. They should be licensed in format to facilitate reuse. In some of my other videos, I have talked about copyright issues. When you publish your article in the traditional model, you give up the copyright. If you're using a preprint, you retain the copyright and you license it with a Creative Commons license. Preprints provide a record of priority. Preprints do not lead to being scooped. Some authors might worry about that. If I release my results as a preprint before I've published it, can't some other researchers go and copy my experiments and publish before me? According to these authors, that is not likely to happen. Rule five, preprints provide access to scholarly content that would otherwise be lost. So this point is getting at the fact that sometimes it's really hard to publish results, even if they're good results. So maybe they are negative results, or maybe it's just some results that don't make up enough of a story to have a complete publication. So you can still submit those to a preprint server and other researchers can access that information and even cite it. Rule six, preprints do not imply low quality. So some researchers, especially early on when the concept was being introduced, thought that releasing preprints before peer review would mean that low quality research is being published because peer review is a form of quality control. And we'll come back to this point in a few slides and look at the quality of preprints compared to journal articles. Rule seven, preprints support the rapid evaluation of controversial 
results. Number eight, preprints do not typically preclude publication. Now we've already looked at the top 100 clinical journals and 99 of those allowed or would consider preprints. Number nine, preprints can further inform grant review and academic advancement. And we've already talked about that with the ARC and the NIH. But one of the cons they bring up is point number 10, preprints. One shoe does not fit all. Some information is just not really suitable for preprints. If you would like more details about when preprints are not appropriate, as these authors describe, all of my sources are linked in the description below. Let's look at some evidence for citation rates are higher for articles that have been released as preprints. This is an article that was published in 2019 in eLife, and they show that releasing a preprint is associated with more attention and citations for the peer-reviewed article. So when you release a preprint and then you subsequently publish it in a journal, that journal article gets more citations than if you had gone directly to the journal. Their evidence for that is shown here. They looked at a wide number of journals. All of these have a journal impact factor of greater than five. I have a previous video on journal impact factor. I'll link to that up above. And you can just glance over this data and see that for almost every journal, when there was a preprint first, the citations tend to be higher. Now, sometimes they're not very much higher, but overall, they average higher. Another article that looks at this same research question was published in QSS, and it's about the relationship between bioarchive preprints, citations, and alt metrics. In this article, they found that bioarchive deposited journal articles had sizably higher citation and alt metric counts compared to non-deposited articles. And their data for that is shown in this figure. The blue line shows the, the citations per paper per month for articles that had been deposited in bioarchive. And the yellow line below shows the citations per paper per month for articles that were not released as a preprint prior to publication. And then in panel B, we see the difference between those two curves. How about quality? This article published in 2020 showed that peer-reviewed articles had on average, higher quality of reporting than preprints, although the difference was small. And they also suggest that publication in a peer-reviewed journal is associated with improvement in quality of reporting, and that quality of reporting in preprints in the life sciences is within a similar range of that of peer-reviewed articles, albeit slightly lower on average. So these results are in line with the assertions that we read earlier, that the quality of preprints is not lower than the quality of peer-reviewed journal articles. Although this, this result says they're slightly lower, you would expect that because typically preprints are revised before they are submitted to the journal articles based on feedback that they get from readers prior to submission. But the fears that the quality of preprints are going to be substandard just didn't come true. They're only slightly less quality than published journal articles. So how are the authors getting feedback on these preprints? This is from the 2019 publication on BioArchive. And this figure is showing that over 40% of authors are getting feedback on their preprints through Twitter. And more than 35% are getting feedback by email, more than 30% are getting feedback by talking to colleagues. About 15% are getting feedback through the bioarchive comments section, and nearly 30% didn't get any feedback at all. So it appears that most authors are getting at least some feedback on their preprints that they can then use to improve their final article. Now the question might come to your mind, why do authors publish preprints? So we've talked about a lot of the benefits and a few of the downsides, but in this study, they asked the authors themselves. 3,189 authors were surveyed for this graph, and we can see the reasons why they are going to submit preprints. The top reason is to increase awareness of research. The second 
most highly cited reason is to stake a priority claim. The third reason is to help meet new people in the field, so to expand the network. Fourth reason is that the authors felt it would help them enter or progress in the field. It initiated new collaborations, helped them receive a conference invite, helped them receive a grant or a job offer or attain tenure. And probably for most authors, it's a combination of these reasons. So we get to the main question now, should you publish preprints? Based on the information that I presented to you, I would say yes, you should strongly consider publishing your research as a preprint. Probably not going to get scooped. You're probably going to get some good feedback that you can use to improve your work before you submit it to a journal. And you're probably going to get more citations on that eventual publication if it has been out as a preprint. And you'll probably get more attention for your research. And if you're not getting your research out and people are not seeing it, it's not going to have an impact in your field. So I think overall, it's clear that in 2021 and beyond, preprints are the way to go. I'd like to show you one more publication. This article looked at preprints during the first year of the COVID-19 outbreak. And within that first 10 months, there were 125,000 COVID-19 related scientific articles published, and more than 30,000 of those were hosted by preprint servers. Now, if you want more information, I suggest taking a look at this paper. They provide a lot of data showing that during COVID-19, the role of preprints really increased in importance. There was increased scientific and public engagement with preprints. COVID-19 preprints were accessed more than non-COVID preprints. They were cited more and they're shared more on various online platforms. And some of this changing relationship with preprints due to COVID-19 is probably going to change additional policies. So I think those journals that are now resisting preprints are eventually going to become accepting and they're going to to allow publication of journal articles that were previously released as preprints. I think that's just inevitable at this point. I hope this video was helpful to you. If it was, please leave a thumbs up and consider subscribing to the Grants and Publications YouTube channel if you would like to see additional scientific writing related videos. Thanks for watching and happy writing.